seven. Our passage is going to be First Peter five, verses five through eight. First Peter. James happens when we have the four weeks in a month, and then on the fifth week, fifth week when the month falls with five weeks, and we do something a little different. We shake it up a little bit. So next week we'll be back in James. Let's just pray this morning. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity again to be in your house, God, to worship you, Lord, with all our hearts, with all our might, Lord, with all our souls. Father, I thank you for each person that's here today because I believe, God, that you have a reason why why each one of us is here today, God, that you desire to meet us where we are, Lord. And so, God, this morning as we get into your word, Lord, that everything that you want us to glean from it, Lord, we will take to heart. And anything that is chaff, anything that needs to be burned up, God, will just fall away. In your name, amen. I don't know about you, but I have certainly been feeling some burdensome attitude in my life lately where I've been carrying burdens, whether it's been from a long time ago or current things that are happening in my family or even within our church family, there's some lot of burdens going around. Can you agree with that? If you watch anything in social media or if you watch television at any time or watch the news, you're going to see things that are going to cause you to want to carry burdens of what's going on in, the, in society. You might have issues going on in your job, And you might carry that around a little bit. And you might have finances. Your bank account might be saying, you're not going to make it, girl. Right? And I can start worrying about those things and taking those things to heart. And pretty soon, my burdens become bigger and sit on the throne of my heart than God does. And so this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about a few things that God showed me um, this week. I've been in the process of learning to lay it down continually, not just when I get to the breaking point, right? But when I feel the burden to lay it immediately down. Okay, 1 Peter 5, starting at verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because... God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, and cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and so of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We're going, this is only three verses. There's a lot in there, but we're going to quickly tear it apart. And I'm hoping that whatever you need this morning in the word is going to plant deep in your heart, and you're going to have some freedom today in areas where you are struggling. The Bible says that the word of God doesn't come back, what? Void. So just even listening to it just now, the word of God has gotten in your heart, and something out of that passage has already, I believe, begun speaking to you this morning. So the first part says, in the same way you who are younger, submit yourselves to the el- your elders. Now look around. We got all kinds of ages in here. We got little Max sound asleep back there on the back pew. That's okay because he's a baby. He could sleep in church. We have, I don't know, if I'm, I'm going to guess, Pastor Cook, that you're probably the oldest one in this room. We have got an amazing group of ages, of pasts, of jobs, of life walks in this room. And here this passage says, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. Now, not every elder I have ever met deserved my attention or my submission. But when you come across a man or woman of God who's a gray-haired, so to speak, Scripture calls them gray hair. That's not disrespectful. When you come across somebody that is an elder, 
where you know they have gone through the fire time and time again and they have come out purified by the grace of God, align yourself with those men and women. And this is why. They have a lot of wisdom to share. And then you glean from it. And some of it may not be appropriate for what you're going through, but I tell you there is nuggets in that wisdom. And when we're younger, and I still consider myself young at 53, when I'm younger, I think I got it all going on and I know what I'm doing. But when I sit next to somebody like Mamie and I listen to how she talks to God in her prayer, something stirs in me and makes me want to be like her. And that's what it's about. To spur each other on. Align yourself with the elders who have wisdom, obviously first who serve God, and whose track record and testimony deserve the submission. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. This is saying to you and me that we need to be wearing our clothing, our righteousness, our humility as our clothing that covers us every day when we come together. Humility. Not any of us in this room should be rising, raising ourselves up above our, above our brother or sister that's sitting next to us. Because at the foot of the cross, I'm just as dirty as you are, and you're just as dirty as my sins. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ came to save you and me, not just this degree of sin or this degree of sin, but he came to save the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I know that we, maybe you or me, at one time or another, have thought myself haughty or higher than thou. And I bet you that there's some of you in this room that have felt that you're better than the one sitting next to you. But I'm telling you, this says right here, God opposes that. So hear this. That is opposing, that is opposite of what God wants. So if you are haughty, if you are holier than thou, if you are walking around in judgment and critical of your brothers and sisters, Scripture saying, God opposes you. I don't want to be opposed by God. But if I can be humble, and if I can show my brothers and sisters grace and mercy at whatever point in their walk that they are, it says, God will give me favor. Who wants the favor of the Lord here? I do. I certainly would rather be walking in his will and in his favor than thinking I'm over here all that and I'm in opposition of God the Father. Because when I get to that place is when I always fall down flat on my face. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to all those who humble. Humble yourselves so that in due time, under God's mighty hand, he will lift you up. What does that mean? Whenever you do things for the Lord and you do it, not necessarily for the Lord. Let me change my sentence. Whenever you serve in the church or serve at some type of ministry and you want to be recognized for what you do, that is not humility. But when you are humble in that and you serve the Lord in due time, the word says, God will raise you up. So if you are doing things because you need a pat on the back or you want to feel good about yourself, I want to challenge you to step down from whatever you're doing because you're doing it for the wrong reason. When you serve, either whether in this body or outside of this body, or you serve your family and you're doing it, out of wanting your flesh to feel good about what you're doing, you're doing it for the wrong reason. The Bible says if you can do all things unto God, right, he will bless the work of your hands. In due time, he'll give you the attention that you need. And you know what? It'll be so much sweeter because it'll be anointed and full of the Holy Spirit when you get that attention. And what will happen when you get that attention is you will not become prideful. And I know that we've heard pride goes before the fall. 
Many years ago, I was asked to sing at a gigantic church. When I say gigantic, I mean, because we're a small church, and I love my small church, but this was a big church. had like four services. Thousands of people went there, and they asked me to do a solo, which was really hard to even get on their worship team because you had to go through a series of try tryouts. And, I mean, it was just this huge thing, which I understand. But I was asked to, and part of it was that my daddy was on the board. So, you know, I had a little bit of sway. But they asked me to come and sing a solo, and my dad took me out and bought me a nice dress. And because we were, you know, we were trying to live on love at that time, and that don't work. We were young and we married. <laughs> so Pop Ramen um, finances couldn't buy a new dress. So Daddy bought me a dress. And I got up there in front of all these people, and I sang my heart out. And it was four services, and after church, people were coming up and congratulating me and saying, that was so beautiful. Why don't you sing more or whatever? And I walked out of that building, and my heart said, huh, you did pretty good. I bet you're going to get on the worship team now. And pride became my clothes. Does that make sense? And you know what happened to my heart because of that? I was not asked to sing there or at any other church or lead worship for four years. Pride, I fell. Because all of a sudden, it wasn't about singing to the Lord. It was about my dad got me a new dress. I'm singing at this big church, and I nailed it. I didn't mess up not one time. And I became prideful. That wasn't humble. But I tell you what, anytime pride comes, I know it now. I can smell it, and I can feel it, and I know immediately I tell that thing where to go because I won't do that again. I've been there, done that, and I'm not a stupid girl. I'm not going back there. So now we're getting to the nitty-gritty of where my heart really was of what I wanted to talk to you is verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. When we can cast our cares on him, what we're going to get is peace. When I'm carrying around all this stuff, my, and I know that some of you, I know probably every single one of you do this. We have this amazing recorder in our brain that records things, past things that have been done to us, whatever. And when I'm carrying these burdens, something pushes play in there, and I'm reliving it, or I'm doing a whole checklist of my, in my heart about all these burdens I'm carrying right? I'm doing inventory. What happens to my heart and my spirit at that time is I become heavy and weary and I don't have peace. So humility, humbling myself, humbling yourself is the first prerequisite to receiving the peace of God. When I'm full of myself, I think that I can handle it all. Amen? Something may seem little, it's like, oh, I got this. Something may seem big and I, oh, I got this. I got this, God. And I don't take it to him. I can have an attitude that is so arrogant that I don't rely on God for any direction in my life. So I've been mocked before, and Pastor John has been mocked before, because we ask God um, for simple things. We ask God for direction on what, um, okay, for like the church. I've been calling for roofers. So we ask direction for that. People think that's silly. Well, why? God has the whatever roofer that he needs us to have, and maybe that roofer is praying for provision. We don't know. When we had to take Sam to the neurologist in the, a couple of weeks ago, and our insurance oh, it sent me this paperwork of 50 doctors and wanted me to choose a doctor. How was I supposed to do that? And so I started at the top, and I started calling and calling, and either they didn't do juveniles or they didn't take our insurance, whatever. And I was getting really frustrated and angry, and then I thought, oh, I'm just going to pray. So I said, Lord, please direct me to the right doctor that Sam needs to see. And so I just started going down. I started reading names until my, my, the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart. I know that sounds weird. I'm telling you it was the truth. He spoke in my heart. I called him immediately. We got an appointment. We got in there, and it was a different doctor. So at first I was like, Lord, you told me this. Well, 
I believe that this man, this other doctor, whose name was not on the list, was the man that he needed Sam to see. And because this guy was in this guy's practice. And he was an amazing doctor. And so I gave thanks. So I cannot be so arrogant that I don't ask God for the directions and the little things, even when you're spending money. Sometimes John will say, let's go out to eat, and we'll get in the car, and we'll, go, we'll be heading there, and all of a sudden he'll say, oh, I don't feel like we're supposed to spend the money. I'm like, what? I was looking forward to not cooking. But we, we have to listen to that. No, you don't need to spend that. You need to go back home. Simple. I cannot rely on my own abilities to take care of the problems in my life or I'm wasting my time here and I'm wasting my time being a child of God. Why do I serve him? Because he loves me. He's paid the price for me. But I can't be a child of God who's just going to step out and do everything on my own because I'm always going to fail. You can see stories in both the Old and New Testament of people who have stepped out on their own and screwed their whole lives up. But then we know that all things work together for good. So, But if you can save yourself that heartache by just listening and being obedient, wouldn't you do that? I would say, yeah. When I get in that state of pridefulness, I might not even know that I'm there. It's like me saying, okay, God, I got this. What you got next to the enemy? It's like me saying to God, I don't need your wisdom. I don't need your grace. I don't need your mercy. That's what it's saying. I'm going to take care of it on my own. But you and I were created to be his children, to grow in him, to learn from him, to listen to him, and to follow him. I read this quote this morning by Paul Tripp, and it said he talks about sufficiency, self-sufficiency, which is outside of God. We all like to think of ourselves as more independently capable, capable than we actually are. Can you agree with that? We weren't created to be independent. We weren't created to be autonomous. We weren't created to be self-sufficient. We were made to live in a humble, worshipful, Lovely, loving dependency on God the Father and in a loving and humble interdependency with our brothers and sisters. Which means when I depend on God and I'm trying my best to be a woman of God, I get to also depend on you and you get to depend on me. And yeah, we'll mess up and we'll fail sometimes, but you repent, get back up, and we carry this together. So verse 7 says to cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So I did a search of, of cast. And um, so Peter was a fisherman. I think most of us know that. And back then it wasn't big fancy fishing poles. They fished with nets. So to cast a net took a lot of effort because the nets were heavy. They weren't manufactured in a big factory somewhere made out of nylon. This was heavy, handmade rope. And it more than likely was heavy not just because of what it was made with, but because there was seaweed in it and because it was wet all the time because this is how they lived. They had to fish. That's how they lived. And so when he's using this analogy to cast all your cares on him, he is talking about that net. And you have to pick up the, I could not find a net because, you know, well, we don't live where the, we fish with nets. But I couldn't find a net because I wanted to show you. You kind of swing it way back and you cast it like this so that it spreads out and then you let go. And hopefully the net stre stretches out and it lands in the water and it sinks. So can you imagine you and me having these burdens? And he says, cast your burdens on the Lord because he cares for you, for you to take all those burdens and cast them into the Lord and allow them to sink and not look at them. The hard thing for you and me, though, I think, is that I will roll it back in <laughs> before <laughs> and I will inspect those burdens again and I'll check it before it's done. And usually when I do that, it's covered in barnacles and fish poop and slime. 
when I checked those burdens again because it wasn't the time. So when we cast our burdens on the Lord, the challenge for us is to leave it there. Allow God to do the work. We can't put our cares on anybody else until we take it to the Lord first. So when it says to cast all my cares, it all means every single little one, everything that's bothering you. If you can't sleep at night, God cares about that. If you don't know if you're going to have enough money in your gas tank, God cares about that. If you have lost loved ones in your family, God cares about that. If you are struggling with your grades in school, God cares about that. There is nothing in your life that God does not take an interest in. Isn't that amazing? You are always seen. So it says, cast all your cares on him. It is not saying for me to go cast all my cares on Sandy. Thinking that Sandy is going to fix it for me. Because she can't. She can pray with me and she can give me some wisdom, right? But she can't fix it for me. And so what happens when I cast all my cares and burdens and anxieties on the Lord and I let him take care of it, if I need help from my sister, she can come alongside and say, I'm just going to agree in prayer, but you leave those there, and then we're going to see what God does. We cannot pull that net up before it's time. Because I, w- I promise you, if you let God do the work with those burdens underneath that wave, when it is time for you to see what he's done, he'll tell you to pull it in. And you can see, this burden, look what God did. That thing, look what God did. This thing, look what God did. At his timing, in his way. Because scripture says that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. So when I give him everything and I, I cast it out and I walk away and I don't check on it, I know that at the appropriate time God's going to say, look how I made this work out for you. There's a story of Jesus and his disciples. And they Jesus had been speaking and the disciples were getting hungry and one of them said, I'm gonna go get I'm gonna go fish a little bit. And so some of the disciples said, Cool, we'll go with you. So they probably didn't say cool, but they said, Yeah, we'll go with you. So they get in the boat and they go off a little bit from from land and they throw their cast their net over and they wait. All night long. And when they pulled it back in, they saw there's no fish. Hmm. So er, verse 4 of that passage says, Early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize them. So all night... They'd been fishing, and I bet they were having fellowship, and they were tired, and they probably slept in the rocking of the boat, and they're thinking, tomorrow we're going to have a good catch. But Jesus says, hey, friends, haven't you caught any fish? By this time, they had already rolled it in, reeled it in, whatever you call it, gathered the net back in. They didn't recognize Jesus. He said, they said, no, we haven't caught anything all night. And Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. And they were only about 100 yards from the shore. Okay, so there's a few things there that we can look at. Throwing your net in the appropriate, casting your net, casting your burdens in the appropriate way and to the appropriate one is key. I cannot cast my net to alcohol. I cannot cast my burdens onto overeating. I cannot cast my burdens onto the television set. I cannot cast my burdens onto people who don't serve the Lord. Are you following me? When I take all of that that's in me and I'm not taking it to the Lord, I'm going to have an empty catch. I'm going to have emptiness because God's hand is not on it. I'm being prideful and I'm controlling it. I'm controlling where I'm casting it. But he says to cast everything on to God, to cast it all. So Jesus said, change, change where you're casting it. Put it on the other side of the boat. They didn't even have to wait a whole day 
immediately they got what God had intended for them. They got the catch. God provided. So when I take my burdens and you take your burdens, your anxieties, your fear, your pain, and you cast that into the right place, which is on God, cast all your cares, and you let it be, God's going to provide, and he's going to do miracles. And I'm not saying that just because it's the pretty Christian thing to say. It's because I walk it. And there's plenty of people in this room that I know your testimonies, and you've walked it too, where you have cast it and say, okay, God, I'm giving this to you, and I'm walking away. And then pretty soon we start hearing testimonies of God's goodness. So what is this? Let's go ahead. A bottle. You, you can't answer. I already practiced on you. <laughs> what is this? Come on. A bottle of water. How much do you think this weighs? Maybe. Yeah, probably about a pound. If I stand here and hold this bottle of water for the next 15, 16, maybe 20 seconds, is the water going to change? Can I change it by holding on to it? But what if I hold on to this bottle in a half hour? What's going to happen to that bottle of water? Now it's going to get hot. <laughs> what about an hour or maybe two hours from now, am I still holding this bottle of water? What's going to happen? My hand's going to start hurting. Has the water changed? Has the weight of the bottle changed? What about two or three weeks from now, and I'm still standing here like this? What's happening to my arm? Yeah. It's burning. I'm probably trying to find something to lean on. I'm probably thinking this is the stupidest lesson I've ever done, right? Has the water changed? Has the weight of the bottle changed? What if this was your burden? You pick it up right now first, it's light. An hour from now, it still might be a little light. Three weeks from now, you're going to be feeling it, brothers and sisters, because you're going to start getting tired of carrying that burden. Has the burden changed? Mm -mm. Did the weight of the bottle change? What changed is my tiredness and my weariness because I didn't cast it where it needed to go. It's a really simple object lesson if you think about it. That the problems that I had did not change. It was the weariness of my heart from bearing burdens that God never called me to bear in the first place. So cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And we know that he does because we know that he sent his son to die for us. And we know that he didn't stay dead in the gra gra ground, that he rose again, right? That's how much he cares for you. Then it goes on to verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. So there's a lot of different ideas about what that passage of scripture means. But what this is really saying is that you need to pay attention by being sober and alert. That means anything that messes with your thought processes, whether it is an outside drug or whether it's your thought process just in who you are as a person, whether it is how all you've grown up and you've been told you're nothing all your life, whatever it may be, those things can cloud your mind and make you not sober and alert. And I'm telling you that the enemy is ready to pounce. And if you are not sober and if you are not alert, you're going to find yourself in the jaws of the enemy. So to be, so, to be alert and to be sober-minded, your spirit needs to be full of the, of the spirit of God. First of all, you need to have the Holy Spirit in you because that's where the discernment comes in. And when the enemy starts prowling, you're going to be quickened to it. Like Pastor John says, it's a spider, spidey sense. But I usually can tell by a feeling. 
And I look a lot with my eyes and I observe a lot with my eyes and my eyes sometimes will deceive me on a situation and that's why I need to trust the Holy Spirit. And so when I hear the enemy coming at me because I have a sober mind and I'm alert, I can stand firm and not be taken out at my knees and land flat on my face because I'm consumed with everything else. Be alert and be sober-minded because the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That is pretty um, to the point. He's looking for someone to eat. He is looking for someone to kill. And you are never more flavorful, more full of beautiful garlic, salt, and pepper than if you are a spirit-filled Christian. And he wants to destroy you. He doesn't want you to be salt and light. He doesn't want you to go forth and make disciples. He doesn't want you to cast your burdens on the Lord. He wants to keep you bound and down and make you ineffectual. And then before you know it, your eyes are on yourself and off of the Lord. And then you are easy pickings. If you've ever watched any of the National Geographics and how lions hunt, it's really quite an amazing thing. Because they single out the weakest of the animals. And they wait. They don't necessarily even have to herd the weakest animal off because you know what? If you watch them, the weakest animal is not paying attention and just will graze a little bit further off than the rest of the herd. Watch it. National Geographic. And then the hunt begins. And most of the time, it's a small antelope or something that I've seen or some type of, of um, hyena. And the lions hunt together. And they will kill that prey fast. This is exactly how the enemy works, which is why he's talked to, it, talked to us about it in his word. He waits for somebody who's weak. And when your eyes are off of him, you are weak. When you are not serving him, you are weak. When you are carrying burdens on your own, you are not relying on what God says, then you are going to find yourself in a vulnerable situation, and the enemy will send somebody to trip you up. You know how affairs are started? Affairs are started simply by someone not being happy in their marriage. It doesn't even have to, and I could tell you time and time again, I've seen it several times happen. It doesn't always happen this way, but somebody's unhappy with their spouse. And instead of casting that care before the Lord or getting the help that they need, they internalize it and they try to fix it themselves. And then lo and behold, somebody comes across their screen on social media. Or they meet somebody in the parking lot. This happened to my girlfriend. Oh, he's really nice. We just, we just went and had a talk. And before you knew it, her whole life exploded. Easy. She was feeling weak. The enemy provided whatever she felt she needed. And that's a hard word. In my own life, when I'm struggling and, I've, and maybe I'm not reaching out for help and I've separated myself, that is always, always when I hear that somebody's saying bad things about me or think I'm a terrible person or think that I could do way better as a pastor. That's when those things are going to come to me, when I am weak, when I am not in the word, when my self-worth is in what you guys think about me, when my self-worth is what God uh, my, my family thinks about me. Whenever I get outside of what God has for me is when I separate myself and I'm weak and I start listening to the devil. Simple. It's a simple thing. He doesn't have to be big and conniving. He looks for your weaknesses. This is why we have to put on the armor of God. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. I don't want that to be you. And I don't want it to be me. And this is why we have to lean on each other and we have to cast our burdens onto the Father. All of our anxieties, all of our burdens. Verse 9 says to resist him standing firm in the faith. When the enemy comes at me and he comes at you, 
You simply stand firm in what you know to be true. And the only way that you're going to know what is true is by getting into church that preaches the gospel, by being underneath leadership that actually open the word of God. How are you going to know is by you yourself opening the word of God. However you need to get the word into you, if you have listened to it on your iPod or whatever, I don't care. Get it in there. Because when the enemy comes and starts attacking you, you can stand firm and say, but God says this. I don't care what he says. What's the truth? The enemy, we tell the children in children's church, the enemy always, always, always lies to you. He will never say the truth. But God always, always, always speaks the truth. There is no deceit in God. So when the enemy comes at you to stand firm in your faith, know where, who you are. Who do you belong to? Who fights for you? And I cast my cares on him, and I'm right standing with God. And when the enemy comes, I can say, I bind and rebuke you. Get away from my family. Leave me alone in my thought life. Whatever it may be, I get to do that because I am a child of the Most High God. The power that God holds is in me because his son lives in me. I am joint heirs with his son. So when I struggle with something, if I struggle with the spirit of fear, if I struggle with doubt, I get to stand firm knowing who I am. And guess what? If you don't know where it is in the Bible, you can Google it. The other day I just typed in part of the scripture because I couldn't remember, and beautiful Google showed me right where to look. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Here is the other way that the enemy can get to you is by you thinking you're the only one that's going through what you're going through. What's so special about you? You're not the only one who has struggled with alcoholism. You're not the only one who has struggled with a stinky attitude. You're not the only one who has struggled with food addiction. You're not the only one who has had problems within the body of Christ. You're not. There's nothing any more special to you than there is of me. Why? Because even just like my sin and your sin, it's all the same at the foot of the cross. I'm a dirty, filthy sinner just as much as you are. And I am redeemed by the blood of Christ just as much as you are. God is good. So there is always somebody who's walked your walk before you. And it may not be exactly the same, but there's always somebody who has walked your walk before you. And you may never meet that person, but you certainly would have some way to pray, God, whoever in the world is suffering like I'm suffering in this situation right now, be with them. Because we shift the tide when we take the eyes off of us and we start doing what God tells us to do. When I stop thinking all about myself and my, pro my problems, the tide shifts when I say, God, help them, help that person, bless the people in our church, heal this person, bless that person. It's not that God doesn't want me to pray for myself, but when it can become all about me, then I've thro thrown him off the throne and I've climbed up there in the throne of my heart. And now I'm bearing burdens again. Last week I told you guys that I was going to ask God to reveal in your heart if there was anything contrary to him. And I just want to just give me a nod if God showed you things you need to clean up this week. Thanks, babe. He, he doesn't follow instructions. <laughs> Mary. But isn't he good? It's like once he shows me I've done something to him that has hurt his heart or that's contrary to him, I don't like it. It's like when I got caught when I was a little child. I didn't want to get in trouble. But once I had reconciliation with my dad, I was better for it. So when God shows me something in my life that's contrary to him, I go right to him and I repent. I'm sorry, Lord, that I did that. And then I repent, remember, means to turn the opposite and go the opposite way. So I'm so glad that, you got, that God did that. So guess what my prayer for you this week will be? 
is that these bottles that you're holding on to and that the burdens that you're carrying like a treasure around because it's comfortable sometimes to carry our sorrow and when you can't get past your past, my prayer is that you're going to feel the holy fire burn in the muscles that you're holding on to this stuff. Where you, you know, get jiggle legs when you run too, obviously I don't run a lot, but you get the jiggle legs because you've ran too much, you know, where you're weak and tired. I pray that that is rapidly upon you so that you don't carry the burdens anymore. We don't have time to mess around with this stuff. We got to, as Brother Gene says, take our relationship with God seriously. We are clean in house. That's what this is about. So this week, ask God what burdens you're carrying. Maybe it's unforgiveness. That's a rough one. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's rage. Maybe it is um, alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. I don't know. I just cover the gamut. Anything that's contrary to him that you're carrying around is too heavy for you to be carrying around. What do you need to carry? The gospel of peace. That is the only thing you should be burdening. And then coming alongside your brothers and sisters and bearing their burdens. Because when we do that, that is furthering the gospel. But the private things that you guys are carrying, God wants to set you free once and for all. And I know that for me to stand up here and say that to you seems easier said than done. But I'm going to tell you something. It comes through the renewing of your mind. It comes from you being willing to be peaceful before God and not dig that stuff up and look at it again to see if it's done cooking. There's a lady that I know that is a Christian neurologist, and I was reading some stuff about renewing your mind, and she said, in your brain, you literally will develop um, pathways of negativity. And when you think on things bad that are negative to you, you will actually make neg negative pathways. And she said the way to do that is to fight it through the word, renewing your mind. And so she said for every specific thought, have a specific scripture for it. So that when you have a thought of fear, let's say, because I used to struggle with fear. Fear would come upon me. Something's going to happen to my kids. Something's going to happen to John. We're not, you know, I have fear, fear, fear. Then whenever fear comes, I have a specific scripture that I could do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Okay. Then when another thought might come to me, that you are less than, you are dirt, nobody loves you, whatever it may be, that's another specific thought, then I have another specific script. See, it's going to take some work on your part. You're going to have to memorize. You're nothing. The specific scripture, when I start to feel less than, the specific scripture is, I am wonderfully and fearfully made. Scripture, throw it back at the enemy. He can't fight you on that. So when the thoughts come, look, maybe you have two or three things that you're struggling with. Get in the word. Memorize that. And so when that thought comes, I hold up that scripture. And she says physically they've seen it take seven to eight days to change that thought. And pretty soon what you will see is that the more that you fight it with scripture and the more that you have the word of God in you, the farther these things are going to come until a long time from now, you won't even feel it. But then you'll be so full of the Spirit of God, when the devil starts sniffing around again, you're going to feel it and know it. And that's where we want you to be. We want us all to be there so that you can fight the good fight. This morning when I'm going to have um, Brother Gene and, pa and Pastor Cook and Pastor John come up, and we want to pray with you this morning um, we want to help you cast your burdens aside. You don't have to tell us what they are because we don't need to know. We're just men and women up here. But God knows what your burdens are. And if you are struggling with letting these burdens go, I want you to come on up. And we want to help you lift those nets. And we want to help you cast them out into the sea of forgetfulness with God the Father. Amen?